come out here and then decided since we were out in the sun. I almost feel like I drew the, the short straw um, in the sense that I'm taking things that are a little different and I'm going to be uh, going at things a little different. So there are probably a bunch of you uh, that could probably do Catholicism even better than I could. It's not my background. Uh, Stan uh, ended up doing the, the background or like a proto-Trinitarianism and I've spent a lot of time around that issue. And so Vocab said, would you try to do a Messianic Jew looks at Catholicism? And I said, well, that's, yeah, I have thought about the similarities and the differences, but, but I also want you to know that just by looking at my beard uh, and the fact that I'm a father of five, celibacy has not been my problem. <laughs> so I am far from a Catholic priest. Um, two interesting stories from my background as far as past contact with Catholicism. One is when I was a little kid, we went to a wedding. I wasn't a believer at the time, but I was with my parents, and of course we were in a Catholic church with a really large crucifix, Jesus on the crucifix, and I remember we were sitting right near two nuns, and I pointed to the crucifix and said, Mom, is that the guy we don't believe in? And the two nuns turned totally white, wondering what type of creature was in their Catholic church. Uh, the other was when I was back in Vermont, and I did some poetry and I did some speaking, and so uh, I was down at some place, and we were actually at a place where we were invited to a coffee house, and there were a lot of Catholics there, and there was a Catholic priest there, and he tried to explain transubstantiation to this Jewish believer, and so he says, sort of like this, Jesus died, some of his molecules went in the dirt, then the wheat grew in that dirt, some of the molecules from the dirt ended up in the wheat, and then the host was made from the wheat, so some of Jesus' molecules ended up in the host, and so it's sort of like Jesus' body. And I said, well, by that argument, you're also partaking of Genghis Khan when you partake <laughs> of the host. Uh, so those were some of those uh, sort of contacts. Now, the cool thing with street evangelism and apologetics, or apologetics and evangelism, is that before I got to do this, God had me have a conversation for an hour and a half with the Catholic guy at Glendale Glitters who was a fairly informed Catholic. So as I was working on this, God was giving me some practical application. So if you don't hear stuff related to Catholicism, you can ask me about it. Uh, but just to be sure that I probably won't take the things that you'd normally take. Uh, most of what I used came out of this and then actually going on the Vatican website. Uh, and I had this sitting in my garage and said, oh, that's why I have this. It's time for me to read an adult catechism for Catholics. And it's time for me to learn where the Vatican website is. Uh, so um, let's talk about one of the first things this guy hit me with. We were sitting and talking, and so he immediately jumped on the idea that there's extra biblical authority. So he kept harping on the fact that I could have a Christian faith and I want to see if I can see your faces without toppling my laptop. Okay. Um, and he kept hitting me with this, um, well, wait a minute, how do you know what books belong in the Bible? Uh, and you couldn't know that except for the church fathers and extra biblical writings. Now that hit a resonant chord with me because the idea of extra biblical talking about the, the canonical Bible. Yeah. You know what the word canon means, right? Everybody's familiar with that word. Okay. A really struck a chord with me because there is extra biblical, but not in the same sense. There's the idea of extra writings within Judaism. And I thought, well, that's something that's very similar. The idea that you need additional writings or additional tradition in order to interpret your Bible is something common both to Judaism and Catholicism. So let me tell you how it plays out in Judaism just a little bit. One of the books I like was put out recently called The Non-Torah, Exposing the Myth of a Divine Oral Loss. Uh, Stan's probably familiar with it. I don't know. Who wrote that? Uh, that was actually put out by a uh, IAMCS. That's the International Alliance of Messianic oh, Congregations. Oh, no, I'm not familiar with that. It's an absolutely wonderful short book. 
But Jewish people have an idea that at Sinai, not only was there a written five books given, but there was this mysterious oral law that was passed down from Moses through the prophets, through Ezra, to what's called the Great Assembly, and then comes down. So there's this tradition of this other authoritative tradition alongside scripture. Now I'm just quoting from that just to show you how it works in Judaism. We'll talk about how it works in Catholicism. Because it works out differently, but the concept is the same. That there has to be a tradition necessary that has to be divinely authoritative that helps us with our Bible. Okay? This is the way it works in Judaism. Because Bokeham said, could you do a, like a compare and contrast? And I thought, well, that's kind of neat. Um, Maimonides is a Jewish thinker from the, I guess I called the Middle Ages. Yeah. Okay, some people like to debate when the Middle Ages began. Uh, but he ends up making a statement uh, that purports that Exodus 24, 12, he states, all the commandments were given to Moshe, that's the Hebrew way of saying Moses at Sinai, were given together with their interpretations. As is written, I will give you uh, tables of stone and the law and the commandment. Exodus 24, 12, the law is the written law, the commandment is the interpretation that we are commanded to fulfill. And according to the commandment, the commandment's the oral law. Now, what he's doing is he's postulating what was accepted, that there was an authoritative tradition on top of the scriptures which sounded a lot like what this Catholic guy was describing, only he arrives at it differently. But I'm thinking an authoritative tradition that is divine, that's given along the scriptures. Well, that sounds a lot like something that I've heard before, but not the same way. Um, same sort of thing, Michael Brown deals with it. Uh, he has a whole section on it, and he quotes an Orthodox rabbi saying that essentially there was this tradition that is divinely authoritative. Okay, so when this Catholic guy is going to talk to me, he's going to speak to me, and I'm going to say it's not in the Bible, and he's going to say, but that doesn't matter because there's additional authoritative tradition that allows us to hold this belief that is in Scripture. And we spent a lot of time around that. And by the way, this guy was fascinating because he kept saying, well, you're a Jewish person. You understand Talmud. You understand there's an authoritative tradition. You have your authoritative tradition, and us Catholics have our authoritative tradition. And the funny thing was he was appealing to this stuff from my own background for the basis for an authoritative tradition, and then arguing that, well, we have our authoritative tradition, and so you should not be telling me, as a follower of Jesus, that I can't have these extra doctrines because you had an authoritative tradition, and it was okay for your folks, so it ought to be okay for ours. Jeff, you want a bottle of water? Uh, not at the moment, because what I'll do is I'll stare at it, know I should drink it, and forget to do so. <laughs> okay. Um, let's understand how this works in Catholicism. First of all, they have the idea of apostolic succession. Okay? Now, that's a lot like the sages of Israel passing things down. So you have sort of a rabbinical sort of way of doing this. Well, the way the Catholics do it is Peter's office. And they will point to Peter as the first pope. Now, I got that out of here, and I started digging into what does it all mean? Uh, Peter's office as the first shepherd and bishop of the whole body, or college of bishops, who inherit the task of the apostolic college. Listen to the language. Notice how they're appealing to, to words that are apostolic. The pope and other bishops, like the apostles, notice the, the like the apostles themselves, did not substitute for Christ, but are persons in and through whom Christ continues to care for his own. So their argument is essentially that Peter forms a line of succession that is realized in the Pope and in the College of Bishops, which have an apostolic type function of giving us authoritative information about what the faithful are supposed to do. And that's what he's essentially arguing. Now, I didn't get that. I am big on sources, because you don't take Jeff Grant's word for anything, right? You see how Jeff Grant lines up? I got that right from here. So you can't blame the following priests and bishops. 
It's substantiated by the Vatican website, which I found in English. So if you ever want to check out the Vatican website, there's actually a URL for English documents pertaining to the Vatican that I actually have in one of these other slides. But the argument is from Peter and the apostles to the Pope and the bishops, you have an unbroken chain of God-verified or God-accepted tradition. So, in my side, it would look like from Moses, the oral law, to the prophets, to Ezra, actually to Joshua, to the prophets, to Ezra, to the great assembly. On the Catholic side, it would be from Peter, to the bishops, to the first pope, and then continuing through there, you have this unbroken chain of authoritative tradition that you lay over the Bible as an interpretive key to understand it. Okay? Because if I challenged him, he would say, well, now, wait a minute. Of course, the Bible doesn't say that, but of course, we have this authoritative chain here from Peter, and we'll deal with some of the verses that they, they like to go to, at least one that, that this guy really wanted to hit me up with. Now you say, okay, but here's the problem. The Pope's human, right? The Pope's human, and so he could be mistaken, right? No, we took care of that. We have papal infallibility. Mm. See, not only do we have a chain of tradition, which I said is similar to Judaism, but we have a chain of tradition that is coming through to us through an infallible man so that when he gives these pronouncements and adds to this chain of tradition, he cannot be wrong. Okay? Now, that's not so ongoing in Judaism, uh, but it's ongoing in Catholicism. So, I went to that book again. My primer on Catholicism, other than the night of the, the nuns that turned white, when I said we don't believe in this guy, uh, or something else, okay? And I went to this book and it said papal infallibility. The Holy Father has infallibility. I, because of his role in the infallible church. That was kind of interesting to me. I didn't realize we had an infallible church. Um, that is the church which Christ made capable of preaching the faith in such a way that his word can be recognized and is known to be true because it is his. And I kind of went, okay, uh, I'm parsing this out here, but essentially because the church is infallible and the Pope is the head and embodiment of the church that gets revelation for the church, then the Pope is infallible. Now I asked him a tough question. I said, so I have a question for you, sir. Which pope was infallible? The one that signed the agreement with Hitler or the one that repudiated? Because I need to know which pope's infallible. Because now I have two popes giving me different direction. And he explained to me that this has to do with when the pope speaks ex cathedra, which I recognized the word cathedra and had the idea. And I said, so wait a minute, if I understand this correctly, if the pope makes a pronouncement, but he isn't speaking ex cathedra like his, his back end is just an inch over the chair, right? Uh, that is not infallible. But if he is sitting in the chair, that is infallible. I said, well, that's terribly convenient, isn't it? That's kind of problematic for me. Um, I said, but I want to go ahead and understand that. And so that's what you're telling me. It's essentially the Pope can be wrong unless he's not. <laughs> and I said, hmm, whoa, we have a bit of a, a logic gap here, okay? <laughs> but he said, but wait, I need to turn you to Matthew. Don't you believe in the Gospels? I need to turn you to Matthew 16, 18. But I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, the gentleman was unfamiliar with Greek, which would have helped him greatly. Yeah. So right. we're going to uh, go to the Greek. I've had a PowerPoint up here. Now, in philosophy, and I'm dangerous to have a philosophy professor, there's something called the law of non-identicals. Lipnitz, it's the law of non-identicals. How do I figure out if two things are the same? And he would say that the essential characteristics of two things have to be the same for them to be the same. He said, okay, so if I look at the Greek, 
Does the word rock and Peter share the same essential characteristics? Are they the same word in Greek? Now, they could be related and not be the same. You can have overlap without exact sameness. My daughters look a little like me, but they don't have a beard. There's overlap, but there's not sameness. Okay, so there's a difference between overlap and sameness. So let's deal with the proper. Petros, Peter, is a proper name, meaning the stone, and he's one of the twelve. Petra, a large mass of rock, uh, is not Petras. Now, yes, they're related, but they aren't the same. First of all, we can notice a difference in the way the Greek words sound, but let's just attribute that to my pronunciation. Petras is a noun that is singular masculine. That's really nice. Petra is dative singular feminine in the sentence. By the way, uh, Peter's name is nominative because he's the subject of the sentence. Peter is a Hebrew. Um, that just has to do with case endings. By the way, Hebrew doesn't have those. So when I took Greek, it was like, hmm. And they say Greek is easier than Hebrew. Not really. Um, I was also more familiar. Now, since when is Peter a woman? Well, on this rock, feminine, I will build my church, but Peter's masculine. Well, I would consider gender a fairly essential attribute of something. Pretty essential when I get up in the morning. So the rock can't refer to Peter. Now, if you look in context, what does the rock refer to? Well, looking at the Greek, I would tie the rock to Peter's confession by the context of what's going on here. So the rock the church will be built on is Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. But that doesn't get me to a pole. That gets me to what I need to confess and believe in order to be a part of the church. And by the way, I'm going to make a distinction. Do I believe in the universal body? Yes. Catholic can be used for universal. We're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. That's something, you know, he was very big on ours as the first church. And I said, well, well, really, um, how do you explain the term Roman being stuck in front of Catholic? I mean, Catholic means universal, but you stuck Roman in front of it. So now you're talking about a particular type of universal church? Because otherwise you just say the Catholic Church, but you said the Roman Catholic Church, which means you acknowledge that this is some sort of universal church, as opposed to just being the universal church. I'm not just, I'm not necessarily always sophisticated, I'm just plain logical. Okay? Can I ask you a question on that? Even if you were to concede that Jesus was talking about Peter and calling him the rock, how would you jump from that to being Peter is the representation of Christ and is the... Uh, because they uh, go to the rest of the verse. On says, this I will build my church, but, so it's on Peter. But still, even if you say, yes, he's the founder, the foundation of the church, how does that lead to, therefore... Okay, because of their idea of succession. Where's that in that verse? It's not in that verse. They're going to infer that just as there was Peter, okay, there are those that follow in Peter's office. So they, they now treat Peter as a first in a line. Okay. So, but how does that lead to the, the, the successors having ex cathedra authority, though? Even if you do concede that. I, I didn't say it works perfectly. Okay. I just said they say it. I mean, it's almost like saying, and what basis do you have for an oral law passed to the Great Assembly in Ezra without turning to Pirkei Avot chapter 1 right. and reading the succession? And what would they say? Because it, you need this, and it just happens to be. Yeah. Um, it's almost like the extra cathedra decided that Peter could have succession ex cathedra. Okay. He's just throwing a verse out there that creates some sort of biblical rationale for why you would have the first in this line. Okay. So, um, how many of you know who uh, Michael Heiser is? Okay. Confession? I'm not reformed. 
I'm a Biblicist. Here's why. And I'm going to go ahead and do this for a reason, okay? We've been trained to think the history of Christianity is the context of the Bible. We talk a lot about interpreting the Bible in context, but Christian history is not the context of the biblical writers. The proper context for interpreting the Bible, not that I totally hate Augustine, is not Augustine or the Church Fathers, it is not the Catholic Church, it is not the rabbinical movement of late antiquity, which would be the, the rabbis of the Middle Ages and you know the latter period, and the He's dealing with Talmud. It's not the Reformation, the Puritans, it is not evangelicalism in its flavor, it is not right. the modern world at all, or any period. The proper context for interpreting the Bible is the context of the biblical writers. Okay? That's why I'm a biblicist. Yeah. Okay? What the Catholics are doing is they're using an interpretive lens on the Bible. So they're saying this tradition becomes the magnifying glass. Okay, the glasses I look through when I read my Bible. Okay? And my point is authorial intent is what the verse is about. The understanding of the first audience and the intent of the author communicating because he's the vehicle through which God is speaking to real people in real time and space. Okay? And that's absolutely vital to him. But you need to understand that he's in first referring a, a type of a type of interpretive lens. So what I need to do, we'll talk about talking to the Catholic person, what we need to understand is, yes, you're looking at the same Bible, but you're looking at it with entirely different glasses. Okay? And that's the knowledgeable Catholic. The non-knowledgeable Catholic simply knows that he's inherited this tradition. And supposedly it's the tradition of the first church. Yep. Uh, essentially, that's what I got from another Catholic woman, is we're the original church. To which I say, well, historically, is that accurate? I said, well, okay, so who was the first guy to call himself Christian. Uh, a Christian? The Pope. Pontifus Maximus is a term used for one of the Roman bishops who eventually takes a higher role than the other bishops that existed. And just to give you some church history, the Council of Nicaea did not invite the bishops from Jerusalem or Israel. They just weren't invited. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so uh, I always joke that while I'm distinctly Trinitarian, the language is distinctly Greek, and I have to translate that language into a Jewish context when I'm thinking about it with fellow countrymen. There was one bishop, the Bishop of Rome, who claimed the ascendancy over the other bishops, and he uses the term Pontifus Maximus, which is the word we get pontiff from. So I said, well, wait a minute. If there were other bishops, who's the first guy to do that, and when did he do that? Well, it isn't at the birth of the church where you see the term Pontifus Maximus these other bishops developed. So how can you claim that you're the original church when it's hundreds of years later that you have a Pontifus Maximus? Okay. Up until that point, you have the development of bishops. <coughs> Remember, we're talking about Augustine, and he's a bishop. Okay. And so as we're talking about this, there's a gap of time of hundreds of years that yep. you're dealing with. Uh, do you then infer the church didn't exist during the hundred years? Or do you acknowledge the fact that the church existed prior to the original church existing? And what happens to the original church if you do that? Okay. I don't know, that's an incredibly Catholic argument. Uh, but it's a very logical argument. So, um... I didn't deal with Mary. I probably won't deal with Mary because Mary was just a nice Jewish girl if you're a Jewish girl. Okay? Uh, and so I wasn't into... And, and by the way, I didn't deal with icons. Do you know that's kind of funny in the history of the church? East and West Church had a problem with icons. Western Church said, we don't like icons. No, we like statues of Mary with a blue background. I, the very thing they fought against with icons is the very thing that later was adopted. So for a Jewish person, 
statues aren't really a great thing. So that's a contrast. Judaism went to great length to avoid images. Catholicism has images. Okay? And that just has to do with the way things were. You're surrounded by Canaanites, he Hebites, Jebusites, termites, every type of ites. <laughs> and so they all have images, you're going to avoid it. Catholicism allowed for spiritual representations. That does, there is an argument over art, and eventually art gets into the synagogue. But if you visit the old temple in the old synagogue in Capernaum, you will notice there is no people art on that. So then he talks to me about the leaky bucket of grace. I was really interested in the leaky bucket of grace because I had heard about a leaky bucket of grace. But he said, no, wait, you have a problem here. You've received the grace of God, but your bucket has a hole in it. Okay? And so you're leaking grace all the time. So you can't just believe in salvation by grace because you would have to replenish the grace you leaked out. It's like, well, this is an interesting concept. I want to explore this a little further. And so I got him to discuss. So he'd say, we believe in justification by belief in Jesus, except that we have to refill our grace buckets. Okay. So now I'm thinking about this, and, and I'm trying to discuss this. And then I and I'm, go back home and I'm, okay, so let's see if I understand how Catholics refill their grace buckets. Because there's leaks. And I run into the sacraments and the mass. Oh, okay, now I'm understanding the way this works for Catholics. Apparently they believe your bucket of grace leaks. You have to get more grace, and there has to be a means to get grace to replenish the leaky bucket. Because he asked me, what do you do when you sin? And I said, well, yeah, I, you know, I believe in confessing sin to God. Okay. I said, well, then you've lost so much grace. Okay. And so what I got out of this was that the sacraments and the mass provide means for filling the leaky bucket of grace with more grace because you have to have a full bucket of grace to get into heaven. Okay? Now understand, this guy was pretty knowledgeable because he's quoting me church history. He's appealing his lot, his arguments. He's actually using some pretty intense logic. So I said, okay, now I'm going to understand how this works. How does the sacrament give you more grace to fill up your bucket? So I went to the Vatican website. Uh, if you're looking for that, www.vatican.va forward slash archive, and I don't read Latin. Greek and Hebrew, okay. Latin, I didn't take on. So you go to their archive through there, and then you go to forward slash ENG, and that's English, and then you have a series of documents, ENG 0015. If you get stuck when you get to archive, there'll be links. I said, okay, I'm going to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I'm going to go to the Vatican Archive. What do they say? In the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the sacraments are efficacious signs of grace. Now, I highlighted the word efficacious. Okay, because reading their documents was like reading something that a lawyer had put together. All right? Because someone say, oh, well, signs of grace. Well, the idea that, that this picture is the grace of God or what God does in some way. I have no problem with the, the communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, picturing the work of Christ, that's not a... But wait a minute, they use the word efficacious. That means it has an effect. It does something. Okay? Instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church, good so far, by which divine life is dispensed to us. Oh, Visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and present grace proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those that who receive them with required dispositions. I was like, Jewish lawyers, Catholic lawyers, the language is similar. I mean, wow. Parse this. Divine life is in part. And see, they got a leaky bucket. They lost some of that divine 
life there, some of that grace, they got to get more life back. The sacraments are efficacious in providing grace. Okay, and that's what he was presenting to me. Jesus is good, okay, but you need to refill, and that's what the sacraments sort of do for us. Okay? I even went to the Council of Trent, seventh session. This is, again, this is a reprint. I wasn't there, okay? Uh, but there's a book, the seventh session of the Council of Trent, London, uh, Hoover Historical Te uh, Texts Project. And so I retrieved that online. It's amazing what you can find online now. And canon number six, if anyone says that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary unto salvation, but superfluous, and that without them, or without the desire thereof, men obtain of God through faith alone, just the grace of justification through all the sacraments are not necessary. Let him be anathema. So what the Council of Trent is saying is if you say that you are saved by Jesus alone and that grace does not leak out and you don't need to refill your leaky bucket of grace, you are to be accursed and cast off from God. So this leaky bucket thing is pretty important. Man. Uh, that was uh, pages 53 through 67 of the document. By the way, the PowerPoint's available, so if you have a stick, you're welcome to it. Okay? Now, I'm big on, you know, okay? So, I just go ahead and take the bread and the cup, or I just do one of the same. No, no, no. They have to be done by a certain person. The priests are the ones who are responsible for changing those elements, turning them into something. Uh, it was funny, we touched on Neoplatonism. A lot of this connects to the idea that the essence of something can be different than the actual thing. Life is an ideal. And so they, they play off of that. And so the bread and cup don't have to be the bread and cup. They can be something else too. Um, only a valid priest can consecrate, that's turn the elements, so this is a sacrament. In other words, if I have a bread and cup at home, that doesn't fix my leaky bucket of grace. I need a priest to change this so that it, it is a legitimate sacrifice by which I gain uh, grace points, okay? Thus the priest is mediating as a means for additional grace for obtaining one's salvation. Now listen to the language there. The idea is, again, that you need additional grace. The priest mediates in such a way as to change the elements. We're going to talk about what transubstantiation really does, okay? Now I'm going back to my Old Testament. I'm saying, okay, let's talk about priesthood in the Old Testament. I mean, did the cow become not a cow? You know, what's going on here? I sat with a gentleman named uh, no, well, Professor Rabinowitz. Uh, and he did a thing really cool. He loved to just kind of do stuff to us. And so he drew the, the little picture of the, not a good picture of the temple, okay? It's a Noel Rabinowitz picture of the temple, okay? And he said, so what did this do? And, you know, we're all looking here, okay? And if you're even jealous, you know. And he said, not what you think. It removes sin from the community so that God can continue to dwell in the midst of Israel and give covenantal blessings to the nation because God can't dwell in the midst of sin. Responsible to do the sacrifices. One of the main things, or the centerpiece, is that God is literally dwelling in the midst of Israel. You have God locating Himself. It's the omniscient God. We have a whole sermon on this. This just excites me. The omniscient God coming to live, to localize Himself, to be with His people. How bad does He want to be with us? I mean, I don't always like being around people. I'm kind of an introvert. And so God wants to be around people enough to do this. This is like really incredible. And so he said, this is what it's all about. You need to understand when God was dwelling in the midst of Israel, they got blessings, they got protections. 
if God had to withdraw his presence, check out Ezekiel's withdrawal from the temple, protection is gone, blessing is gone, the sacrifices allowed holy God to dwell in the midst of men in a localized way where his full presence was there. He said that's what the temple did. So now I'm thinking, wait a minute, you've got priests mixing leaky buckets of grace with Catholic duct tape called the sacraments, but that's not what the temple was about at all. Where did I get this? Now I'm doing compare and contrast here, okay? Uh, if you go to Numbers 8, 14 through 19, okay, God originally, or at least in some places, talks about the firstborn being his. And he goes on and says, okay, I've taken the Levites instead of the firstborn of the children of Israel, I've given Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work for the children of Israel in the tabernacle, to make atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near the sanctuary. The idea is sinful man can't get near holy God. The priests were the ones to do the work of the tabernacle so that God could continue to dwell among his people. And I'm looking at this, I'm going, I don't see leaky buckets of grace here. This is not the picture of the priesthood that I'm getting. Yeah. That's a really good argument. I mean, I would just also add to that, Jeff, not to mention the fact that Hebrews is really... We're going to get there. Okay. We're going to get there. Then I don't mm -hmm. want to take away your thunder. Yeah, that's okay. Um, this is the problem with having two learned, Sorry. fascinating Jews in the same tent. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, they both kind of know each other's stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of specialization and style. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to go to Hebrews, okay, uh, Marv uh, Richardson, uh, Word Studies New Testament, he comments on this very idea. Okay. Uh, he talks about the priesthood. The writer of Hebrews is making a very important point here. Who was the writer? God only knows. That's what my professor told me to say. God only knows the wrote this. Um, the idea is that all of this stuff had a greater reality which is realized in Christ. Amen. Okay? So he treats these as pictures. I know what Americans think of when they think of like pictures, like mere Polaroids. That's that's not what I mean by types. Okay? God is is pointing to an ultimate reality which these things teach us about. So a good book for a Catholic person would be Hebrews because it deals with a lot of this stuff. Yep. Okay? Um, the writer of Hebrews is going to make a point very clearly that you don't need this continuing system. In other words, in contrast to the leaky bucket of grace, the writer of Hebrews is going to point out the finished work of Messiah. Okay? And his point is going to be that all this stuff here that related to the sacrificial system pointed to an ultimate realization in the person of Messiah. Okay? So if you go to Hebrews, you're going to see, we're going to talk about this, the security that Messiah provides through being the realization of what these things pointed to. What you're not going to see is a leaky bucket of grace. Okay. So if indeed the sacrament of turning the bread and cup is turning it into the body and blood of Christ, then what's happening every Sunday when they do that? Okay, Jewish kid relating this to the sacrificial system. Okay? What happens to the goat when it gets on the altar and you kill it? Well, it's sacrificed. Okay, so this is the equivalent of that system with Christ being in the bread and cup. And I'm going, wait a minute, that means you're saying that Jesus is re-sacrificed every Sunday. Am I getting this right? Yeah. That what you're doing is not merely remembering Christ's sacrifice, but you're actually doing a replay where Jesus is actually re-sacrificed through being in the elements. Well, maybe it's just Jeff Cran's weirdness, okay? So I go to uh, Dogmatic Theology by William, by Thayer Shedd. Uh, 
I have the reference. Um, just to see if maybe I'm misunderstanding transubstantiation. I want to be fair to people, right? Misrepresenting a person's arguments is not good apologetics, it's just plain rude. Good apologetics is when you actually represent the other person's arguments legitimately and historically, and then you try to lead them in where the gaps are. So I look at this. Transubstantiation, the Roman Catholic theory of the Eucharist, according to this doctrine, the bread is changed in its substance, hence the word transubstantiation. To being essentially the bread uh, becoming essentially the body of Christ. Likewise, the substance of wine changes to the blood of Christ, though the bread is no longer bread and the wine is no longer wine. There are accidents. Now, that's a philosophical type term of bread and wine. The accidents of bread and wine, that's the appearance, the outward. Thus, the taste, texture, and smell, this is why they're explaining why the cup doesn't taste like blood when you drink it. Because okay. ah, okay. somebody's going to say, wait a minute, um, this doesn't taste like any human being I ever ate before. And so in order to explain that, the texture, smell, and elements remain unmodified, even though the bread is actually essentially the body, and the wine is actually essentially the blood. Hmm. So now, Jesus' sacrifice is merely like a Levitical sacrifice that has to be practiced on a regular basis in order to be effectual, in contrast to Hebrews, which we're going to end up discussing. Okay? So in contrast to Hebrews, this now becomes merely a little bit... Now realize what's happened here. They've taken the precious sacrifice of Messiah, and they have made it merely like a Levitical sacrifice that needs to be repeated. Uh, okay? They have misappropriated the Levitical uh, sacrificial system, which was never a means of absolution in itself. No Levitical priest ended up saying to a Jewish person, and I better not hear a rabbi say this, you are absolved of all your sins. Okay? You don't see that language there. Okay? Now it points to an ultimate sacrifice that will take care of sin. Okay? This is really cool. Man, our salvation works not only like forward in time, but backward in time. Amen. I, I really like that. Praise the Lord. C.S. Lewis said both good and evil work both forward and backward in time. I, I, I'm a Lewis fan. Yeah. Okay? Um, they've misappropriated, they've totally misunderstood the sacrificial system. they turned it into a repeated thing that provides absolution when Yom Kippur and those never did. Uh, in fact, when you look at the actual passage in, uh, related to Yom Kippur, Leviticus 17, you have uh, the idea of the atonement there is in the plural in Hebrew. I like to say that there's plural in Hebrew and singular, there's you and you guys. Okay? So you want to get New York. Young Kippur was actually you guys. It's plural. The you is plural. We don't have that in English. So it's, it's you guys. I've given the blood on the altar for you guys. A rabbi singer says this is about the kosher laws. Uh, I already did a thing on that. This is not about the kosher laws. Okay? We know from Hebrews that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That's right. Okay? So, was anyone ever saved apart from a sacrifice in the Old Testament? Quiz time. Was anyone ever saved apart from there being a sacrifice available? Who do you think of? Okay, I'm thinking of David. Okay, you go ahead and kill somebody. Okay, you uh, misappropriate their wife, or outside. Got to be polite about this thing, right? Um, that was called the sin of the high hand, was one name for it. It was a deliberate, presumptuous sort of thing. But there wasn't a way around that. That's why Paul makes such a big point of this. Okay? Uh, I'm going to 2 Samuel 12, 13. And so David said to Nathan, I've sinned, and Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. The proper penalty for what David did was not a Levitical sacrifice, the proper penalty was death. And that's why Paul seizes on this, because God justifies David, but not through a particular sacrifice that was available if you wanted to go ahead and commit adultery and take someone else's wife and kill husband. Okay? 
Paul's point is that God, indeed, in times past, not on the basis of no atonement, because the context is still the atonement of Messiah, but on the basis of an eventual atonement, could forgive sin apart from a Levitical atonement. Okay? So as they were looking forward, we look back. Right. That's exactly right. Okay? Yeah. We're in a different place in the narrative. I like to say the Bible is not a textbook. It's not a systematic theology or textbook. It's a story. It's a narrative. We need to treat it as a narrative. All right? Pardon was given outside of. Paul says, just as David in Romans 4, 6, just as David described the blessedness of a man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. David's doing a very Jewish thing, man. He pulls this thing out of Jewish history and he goes, Aha, you're going to tell me that there's no such thing as imputed righteousness. I'm going to tell you that the Jewish scriptures teach it. Have a nice day. Let me pull this verse out and demonstrate it to you. And he's making an incredible argument here. And so that's what we're kind of doing. David or Paul? So, huh? David or Paul was making that argument. Paul is using that argument. Okay? Actually, what you're going to see a lot in your Bible is what we call light to heavy or heavy to light. Oh, this, oh, Mary. Yeah. If this, then that. Yes. If the lesser is true, the greater is true, or vice versa. That's a rabbinical form of argumentation. Most people don't realize how incredibly rabbinical their New Testament is. Light to heavy? Light to heavy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to go heavy to light. Okay? That's a form of argumentation. Paul is pulling this incident out to see, yes, there's an incident I can point to. There's a precedent in the biblical narrative that allows me to say this. So then we get into, the Catholic guy then goes, well, wait a minute now. There's 1 John 1, 9. I can prove confession. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. See? You need the sacrament of confession, brother. Oh, okay. So then I go, okay. Here's the thing. For a verse to work, I've got to go back to the context. What is John talking about? It's not conditional salvation. It's a denial of perfectionism. How do I know that? Because of the verses surrounding it. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. There were people making claims about the fact that given the fact that they were saved, what they did in the body didn't matter anymore. Because there were certain philosophies yeah. going around at the time. So they say, okay, I'm saved, so my spirit is pure, so what I do with my body, my vessel, doesn't matter. John is writing against those particular things. So he's not talking about a conditional salvation. He's denying perfectionism. By the way, if you don't believe that exists, there's a whole denomination I can name that believes yeah. an entire sanctification of yeah. I once talked to that lady and I said, you said you don't sin anymore. I said, well, do you do anything wrong? She said, yeah, that's called a mistake. And I said, well, every mistake I've ever made, every sin I've ever made was a mistake. She just kind of stared at me. You're getting the flavor of my type of apologetics and stuff. Uh, she just kind of looked at me and it was like not the answer she wanted. Okay? There's a claim to perfectionism. So, who's our priest? Well, Hebrews is pretty clear. Jesus has an unchanging priesthood. This is also good with Mormons. Joseph Smith inherited the priesthood of Melchizedek. Well, not according to Hebrews. He didn't inherit the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because Hebrews quotes Psalm 110. Check out Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. The reference is messianic. Messiah will have a priestly office. One of the struggles in Judaism is that the priestly office of Messiah is not really high on the radar right now. Okay? And it's something that needs to be brought. What does Hebrews tell me? He, because of, continues forever and has an unchanging priesthood. 
hey folks, the priesthood of Messiah is non-transferable. Nobody else gets it. Get it? You can't have a transference there. So, what does your Catholic friend need to know? Well, I know he needs to know the gospel. Okay, but he already thinks he's kind of there, right? Uh, he needs to know that Jesus' death and sacrifice fully saves an individual and provides for them. Oh, scary. Not to lose their salvation. Sorry. I've always said that if, if I can't offer my Jewish people more in Jesus than Moses provides, I better not even bother with the gospel. I did not come from the maybe of Judaism to a maybe of Messiah. Okay? I get in trouble with some brothers and sisters. Okay? But I think... I think there's actual theology in the gospel. I don't think you get to choose between the gospel and theology. He needs to know Jesus fully saves. You know why I said fully saves? Because that's the way to get around the once saved, always saved. See, my God is transcendent. That means he's outside of time. So when he saved me, he saved me fully within the time stream. That means he saved me past, present, and future because he's outside of time, and his salvation is trans-temporal. Here's a new word for you. I think we're talking about that in there. Trans-temporal. Okay. Oh, transgenderism, my bad. Different no, no. kind of trans. <laughs> yeah, okay, for Doctor Who fans, salvation's trans-temporal. It covers the whole thing. You don't have a leaky bucket of grace. If you're in Jesus, you got all the grace you need. Okay? Forget the duct tape, forget the leaky bucket. You don't need it. The Bible is the final authority on faith and practice. Hey, the reality is this. How do we know what books the church knew what books belonged in our Bible? I did point out to him, Jesus closed the Jewish camp. You've killed every prophet from, I think it's, it's Matthew 26. You've killed every prophet from Abel to Zechariah, son of Berkai. Do you know that my Bible didn't have the same order of books? It had the same books in a different order. The Jewish order is the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Second Chronicles closes the Writings. Zechariah, son of Berechiah, to Abel in Genesis. There's the close of the, the canon. That's why I don't believe in the Apocrypha. Jesus closed the Jewish canon. I don't need anyone else to tell me. I have his authority. Okay? Um... So, the church knew. God, working through his church, knew which books should be included. They had the marks of canonicity. They had the power of the Spirit to transform lives. They elevated the person of Messiah in such a way that it was consistent with what would be known of Messiah. Not making clay birds come to life and doing weird things with them, okay? Um... Are, is the Apocrypha useful? I love those books to understand what Jewish people in that time period were thinking about this history. Okay? They are very useful to help us get into the mindset of the time period. Okay? To understand the mindset of the original recipients. That doesn't mean everything in them was inspired. Okay? There's no special class of priests for the church. I believe in the priesthood of all believers. Why? The priesthood, as far as a special class, was set up for Israel. Israel's not the church. I know it isn't because it doesn't have geographic borders. I don't get to kill my Canaanite neighbors in order to repossess the land. Israel was a theocratic nation. The church is a body. Israel is not the church. That doesn't mean there is an overlap. Remember what we said, overlap is not the same thing as equivalence. Yeah. Okay? Israel needed priests to replace the firstborn to do certain things. Jesus is sufficient for us, and the priesthood that we share in union with him as the priesthood of all believers is quite enough. The Catholic friend needs to know he doesn't need a priesthood, he doesn't need sacraments, and he doesn't need extra biblical tradition. He needs to understand this. So that's my compare and contrast minus statues and Mary. Yeah.
just a month ago when I went to Mexico, I was trying to find a chance to share the gospel with my aunt. Because she's older, you know, she raised me up in Chicago when I used to go to Mexico. But Hebrews 5 was one thing that I used to know to show that I'm like, do you know why we don't need any more priests? Because death prevents us from continuing. But Christ finished the work, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, Amen. and now I'm like, he's there forever because every time I sin, his blood wipes away my sin. But, I, but something I was trying to help understand, you know, that, that role of a priest. That's right. right. That's good. And you have an efficacious <laughs> sacrifice too. The blood of the goats couldn't do that. Well, I think what bothered Luther and Calvin and the reformers so much, what really stuck in their craw um, in the 16th, 16th century was that if it's true that you have to perform the sacraments, whatever they are, even if they are some spigot of grace, you now have a situation where there's something you have to do. There's some, even if it's just receiving the community, you have to do something. And Luther's, uh, the tenet of the Reformation, where Luther said, based on Romans, the, the text and the grammar says it's 100% of what Christ did. There's nothing that you did. And that's the, that was the, the slogan, the, 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 the slant that he took up. He said, right, all of it that. is entirely you. And he called it synergy, that is cooperating with Christ. Uh, if you say there's anything at all you have to do. And that was what the light bulb that went on in his head yeah. when he it realized it. It changes it from that. response to a work. I had a pastor put it this way, Jesus plus anything is not so yeah. Jesus. Okay, in other words, no matter what you claimed to do to add to that work, you've now taken away from it. That. So right. that's what they're reacting yeah. to. Right. And they're reacting to this addition of they're reacting to the leaky bucket of grace. Yeah. Okay. Is what they're reacting to. True. And all the things that got added to it. There's something you have to do. Which was why a certain Californian pastor got criticized for his idea of the Lordship of Jesus. Because there was a question of, is he saying you have to do something? You have to make Jesus in your mind an entire Lordship. Well, now you're doing something first. And if you haven't done it, you're not saved. And so that he was questioned over whether that flies in the face of faith alone by saying yeah. the Lord. We talked about faith and works too. He said, yeah. well, you know, don't you have to produce, you know, and I said, well, you know, here's the thing. An apple tree isn't an apple tree. Uh, it doesn't become an apple tree because it produces apples. It produces apples because it's already an apple tree. Right. Okay, you have to understand what the word fruit is. Fruit is the result of, not the efficacious cause of. So you, you reverse fruit, you made the fruit the efficacious cause of the existence of the tree. I said, try that in real life. Okay, that doesn't work. So you confuse fruit. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm into fruit as much as the next person. But I don't believe fruit makes the tree something. I believe the tree produces the fruit. Because it's right. Yeah. So. Um, so there are my forays into Roman Catholicism as a Jewish believer doing street ministry and apologetics. That's amazing. Thank you. And I think we're about on time. Well, thank you guys for... You said that there's a slide available? I have a PowerPoint. I just need to turn on the computer and... I even have it on a stick. Oh, I, a stick. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, I have an adapter if you have a droid to switch a stick to connect it to your droid phone, but I don't have anything for iPhone. Well, I have your email, so I'll tell them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I will.